Blog Talk Radio. Welcome, world. Welcome once again to Tuesday Talk with Key West Lou. I am your host, Louis Patron. The weeks get wilder and wilder, crazier and crazier. Donald Trump screwing everything up. Uh, the world in turmoil, uh, primarily because of Donald Trump and the moves he makes. On more than one continent, on more than two continents. I'm getting sick and tired of Donald Trump. I think most of you are. Uh, there has to be some happy news to listen to sometimes. But unfortunately, right now, it does not exist, so we have to continue talking about him. Tonight's show, we're going to be talking about him quite a bit. There will be some deviations. You will enjoy what I'm going to share with you, however. Tonight, we're going to travel to London, Brazil, Argentina, Baltimore, New York City, Canada, Gary, Indiana, Key West, and Madrid, Spain. Let's start with the report that was issued late this afternoon by the Intelligence Committee of the House of Representatives. Uh, I am a lawyer. Uh, but I didn't do this kind of governmental work. I assumed this report that was going to come out from the Intelligence Committee would be relatively short, several pages, and say, here's what we believe the president did. One, two, three, four, five. comes out 300 pages. Uh, <laughs> I can't believe it. And they didn't go one, two, three, four, five. After the Mueller report, which was over 400 pages, I'm sick of that kind of report. I want somebody to say, this is what he did wrong, and here are the reasons why, without any bullshit. Lay it down. Simple. Uh, but this is the way it is, I guess. I guess it's now for the Judiciary Committee of the House to take that report and turn it into charges, which is probably going to be a shorter report and going to be the one, two, three, four, five I am looking for. Now, I cannot comment on the report by the Intelligence Committee, which was issued today. It came out late this afternoon. I haven't seen it on TV. There's been a lot of comment about it on TV. But until I've had an opportunity to read it, and I read all this stuff, I find it interesting. I'm a political junkie. I'm sorry. Uh, but I can't comment, so next week I'll make some comments. Here's what I, 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 the conclusions I have come to about the report, however. It apparently is a compromise. Trump has compromised the national security of our country to advance his political interests. Makes sense. The Bidens, uh, Ukraine, uh, and were they trying to influence the, was Trump trying to influence the election, et cetera, et cetera, there. Uh, again, I don't like the fact it's a 300-page report because the stuff's a pain in the ass to read. Uh, but it will be broken down uh, once the judicial Judiciary Committee gets done with it. I am concerned, I am hopeful, the Republicans will not act beginning tomorrow like a bunch of asses and raise all kinds of stupid hell and play games as kids in high school might. Uh, these are grown men with responsible positions running the government of what is purported to be the greatest country in the world, and they should know better there are ways of handling things uh, without jumping up and down and yelling and screaming and making 18,000 motions to stop the proceedings from going ahead. So we shall see tomorrow. Now, our dear friend Donald Trump, he is in London today. Big NATO meeting for three days. Big NATO meeting for three days. This is his third NATO meeting. Uh, the previous two, you will recall, he was a pain in the ass when he went. He yelled, he screamed, you owe us money, you're not doing things right. We should get out, maybe the United States. Russia should be a member. Uh, and he really wasn't a nice guy. And he kept telling the other countries, pay up, you're behind, we're paying more money than you. Uh, this guy's a real thug, he's a bully. Uh, but be that as it may, I expected the same kind of stuff this year. He's been so sweet since he arrived in London. I did not recognize him. I don't think anyone else has. He has a great concern for, the, for NATO. He loves NATO. He recognizes the good that NATO does and can do. Uh, so this came as a big surprise today, uh, at least to me. Now, he wasn't happy, though, with France's President Macron. 
Now, Macron and Trump last year were buddies. Don't you remember? Macron invited him to see a parade. He invited Macron here to the United States to see a parade he put on especially for Macron. Uh, but Macron and Trump do not agree on a lot of things that Trump is doing. And Macron calls it the way he sees it. That's his job, just the way it's Trump's job. But Trump does it for himself. He doesn't do it for his country, whereas Macron is acting for France. Okay? Now, last week, Macron appeared, uh, was interviewed by, uh, let's see, The Economist magazine. And they asked him certain questions, and he gave certain answers. And here's what Macron had to say uh, about NATO. And he said that the, the, the NATO, there was a diminished state within the NATO alliance. The NATO alliance was within a diminished state. And it was because, and I quote, the brain death of NATO due to lack of American support. The brain death of NATO due to lack of American support. Well, we didn't know because he didn't speak up a week ago, but Donald spoke up today while he was sitting uh, in a plush room somewhere in London. And he took it very personal that his NATO, your NATO, he's telling the other countries, has been attacked, has been demeaned by Macron. In fact, he said Macron's comments were, and I quote, very, very nasty. But he didn't yell and scream this like he normally does. And I quote again, very disrespectful. And I quote again, very insulting. It sounds like three comments one would make about something that comes out of Trump's mouth. But put that aside. He's making this up. (laughs) Uh, Macron just doesn't agree with what Trump is doing, uh, which affects NATO. NATO is important to France. It's It's important to all the 28 countries that belong. Because NATO is the strongest military force in the world. It's not very strong politically anymore, but they are stronger. They are 28 nations combined. And and they're still working together militarily, and as long as they keep that way, Putin can keep saying, I want to be a member, or I don't like NATO. Trump and no one else can help him, okay? Now, what do I think about us, the way Trump comes this year, and he's kumbaya, and we're all friends, but this, this bad guy, Macron, from France, I think Donald's a whore. I'm sorry. I say it with all due respect to my president. He is a whore. In fact, he is a two-faced whore. Now let me continue with the with this uh, Macron thing and uh, France and NATO and the United States. Uh, France says uh, Trump rather says today because uh, you know he's always got to screw somebody if he thinks they're screwing him or it's to his advantage. He threatened today to apply new tariffs on French imports. Imports on French tariffs. France is our friend, supposedly on champagne, cheese, handbags, and porcelain. French minister, French finance minister, Bruno Le Maire, he said that the Euro Union would strike back against the United States if Trump did this. They would not stand by. And he's speaking for his country, but he's speaking for all of NATO. They met, and they said, we're not going to put up with this shit from Trump. If he does this, Okay, we're going to impose tariffs on the United States, and the end result is going to be a transatlantic trade war, which accrues to no one's benefit. No one wins a trade war. Now, so Donald comes back with, okay, wait for this. The real reason he wants to impose these new uh, tariffs on France is because France has imposed a digital tax on social media companies doing business in France. What am I talking about? I'm talking about Apple, Facebook, and Amazon. They have businesses in France, and France has imposed a tax on whatever they do. Okay? Trump says this would harm the United States, and these are our companies, and I have to protect him. Oh, boy, isn't that wonderful? Well, typically of Donald. He never investigates, finds out what's going on in any depth, doesn't have people uh, research an issue for him and give him a piece of paper to read because he doesn't read anything. You have to tell him eyeball to eyeball and whatever he remembers, he remembers. Well, it turns out, it turns out, (laughs) this is lovely, I'm laughing, that Austria, Italy, and Turkey 
have been doing this for quite a while, taxing American digital services in their countries, Austria, Italy, and Turkey, and Trump did not know. He says, oh, I'm going to have to investigate these countries and what's going on, too. Okay, now let's talk about Brazil and Argentina, steel and aluminum. Remember last year, Trump imposed a tariff on steel and aluminum. Uh, hurt a lot of companies, a lot of countries, but he exempted certain countries from the tariffs on steel and aluminum. And two of the countries he exempted, they didn't fall under it because they're friends of the United States, they're friends of Donald Trump, were Brazil and Argentina, okay? Now, he's going to impose the tax on them, 25% tariff on steel, 10% tariff on aluminum. And why is he doing this? He says he's doing it because both of these countries, Brazil and Argentina, have weakened their currencies. Companies can play with their money. They have weakened their currencies intentionally. And this affects, listen to what I'm saying, this hurts the American farmer. Now, these two countries, Brazil and Argentina, were having economic problems. They had to do what they did with their currency to survive economically. We do the same thing back and forth on occasion, but that doesn't matter. But he said it hurts the American farmers. Well, this really isn't true. Brazil and Argentina have been the primary beneficiaries of the tariff war between the United States and China. China bought a lot of farm products. <coughs> Excuse me. Soybeans, corn, wheat, rice from our farmers in the Midwest. Our farmers in the Midwest had these contracts with China for years. They had it made. They planted the same thing every year. They knew where their product was going to go. Certain brokers would buy it, sell it to China. Their cash flow was terrific. All of a sudden, Trump goes into this tariff war with China. And China no longer can afford to buy our soybeans, our rice, our wheat, and our corn. And so they had to go someplace else. Or they'd starve. Make sense? Couldn't buy. It was too expensive to buy from the United States. So right away, Brazil stood up and Argentina stood up and said, we'll sell you our soybeans, etc." And for the last two years, Brazil and Argentina have been doing business with China with regard to soybeans, etc. And so... Uh, Trump is wrong. Trump, it's not that they played with their currency that is hurting the American farmer. What's hurting the American farmer is that Trump has this ongoing tariff war with China. Okay? And now he's going to crucify uh, Brazil and Argentina because of this. Because Donald can't seem to resolve the war with China, the tariff war. Uh, he keeps saying next week we're getting together. He's been saying this now for over a year, and they never get together. And China always says we didn't have an agreement. He keeps saying we got an agreement. We got no agreement. And, and Trump takes every opportunity to break their, their chops, if you'll excuse me. And uh, China gets mad. Ch Trump, as smart as he says he is, as well-educated as he says he is, he has no understanding of history. He has no understanding of the Oriental mind. He has no understanding, comprehension of the Chinese mind. You can't embarrass an Oriental. You cannot embarrass a Chinese person. They'll go to their grave before they'll let you take advantage of them. And Trump doesn't understand how to play that game. He just keeps piling on them, and they pile back. And I don't know how this thing is going to be resolved. Now, let's stay with the steel thing in Brazil. This was last week. He's going to increase the, the tariffs on steel <coughs> with Brazil and Argentina by 25%. Well, the Brazil Steel Institute said yesterday, the United States can't do this. And the reason they can't do it, and I'm quoting this now, the tariffs could boomerang on American steelmakers. Because the American steelmakers need semi-finished products exported by Brazil in order to operate their mills. Now, I don't know if this means they, Brazil won't sell that stuff to us, these semi-finished products, or that's part of the steel. I couldn't work this out in my, uh, 
investigation. The uh, or it's just that these uh, these are steel products that would have the tariff imposed on them. These semi finished products, whatever it is, this thing with Brazil ain't going to fly. Wait and see. Watch and see. Now let's go to World's AIDS Day. I, I don't know whether it was yesterday or Sunday was World AIDS Day, and Trump and his good wife, the First Lady Melanie, uh, on their behalf, Trump issued a tweet yesterday uh, on World AIDS Day in the morning, and he said, and I quote, "He and the First Lady have support." for these dying HIV and AIDS people and mourn lives lost. They, 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 they have support for them, and they mourn for lives lost. Well, uh, uh, what Trump wasn't aware of, because I don't think he pays attention to anything, his proposed budget for 2020 came out two weeks ago. There is a section in the proposed budget Uh, providing funding for global HIV programs. We've been doing this for years. What Trump was unaware of, or if he was, I don't think he was aware, I've got to say it that way, his proposed budget slashes funding for global HIV programs by $1.35 billion. $1.35 billion. That's a 30% cut in one year. Whereas earlier in the day, he said, me and Melania, we support you people. We're going to do everything we can. He just took $1.35 billion away from them. Uh, Interesting. Interesting. The man don't know what he does. Jared Kushner, son-in-law to the president. Jared Kushner. Relatively young guy, 35, 37. Uh... Must be smart. Must be very smart. Uh, the president, he works in the White House for the president. He doesn't draw a salary, $1 a year, man. But he's part of the uh, employment record uh, of the White House of the United States government. And Trump has put him in charge of various things he wanted to do. One of the most recent ones being he put the Middle East a year ago in the hands of Jared Kirshner who happens to be Jewish, by the way. Nothing wrong with that, but it ties into the story. And uh, said that uh, my son-in-law is going to take care of this. He's to resolve the Israeli uh, problem with the the Palestinians. Well, you know what happened. Kushner did a hell of a job. He gave everything to the Israelis. (laughs) He moved the capital of Israel to Jerusalem. He took something else down. And he did diddly nothing for the Palestinians. So now we're not talking about his successes in bringing peace to the Middle East. What was announced over the weekend by the president is that his son-in-law, Jared Kushner, was now in charge of the border wall. Amazing, the border wall. And not only did he put it in Jared's hands, he and Jared standing together, he said, We're going to build 400 miles of border wall between now and the end of 2020. That's, my friends, between now and the election next year. Uh, He'll be lucky if he can build 100 uh, miles of border wall. See, they don't own the property yet. They've got to take it by eminent domain. Uh, that's relatively easy to do. A government can take it for any reason. They don't even need it for a public person purpose. But they, they, they've, they've got to have people that go and say there's so many parcels. They have to have realtors who can give them this is what this property is worth. They, they can make offers. They've got to set up headquarters to run these things. Uh, they've got to have whole staffs of people, which they don't have. They've got to put together and work out procedures for them. They've got to make offers to the property owners, most of whom will turn it down for government because governments generally low-ball offers when property is taken by eminent domain. Governments don't seem to offer <coughs> fair market value, and that's what they must pay if they take someone's property. Uh, and I'm sure Trump, Trump is no different than any other governmental officer. He is saying, how can I spend all this money to take all this 400 miles worth of real estate? Uh, screw them. 
I lowball them. They don't want it. The hell with them. We'll eminent domain the property. Let the next president worry about it after I'm out of office in five years. He assumed he's going to be reelected because it would take at least that long. Uh, let me tell you something. There is no money for this either, the walls. Don't forget, where did Trump take money for the walls this past year? And he didn't do very much with it. He took money from the defense budget. He's talking that we got to take care of our military. We've got the greatest military in the world. I put all this money into the military. He took a big chunk of the military money away and gave it to the border wall down in the southwestern border of the United States. Um, we just we don't have the money. He's going to order the money out of his emergency powers. He still has to say where the money's going to come from. He can borrow it from another account. But he's going to have trouble putting the money together. And the House of Representatives is involved in this because they're involved with how the money is allocated and how it is spent in the United States. I now wish to talk about something that I'm sad about. Uh, and it involves the First Lady Melania Trump. Uh, I think she got a bad deal uh, this past weekend. She was speaking at an opiate event at the University of Maryland in Baltimore, okay? Uh, it was an opiate awareness event. It was sponsored by the Be More Youth Summit on Opiate Awareness. The audience primarily consisted of middle school and high school students. When she was introduced, she was booed. Not nicely. She was booed. As she went into her speech, the boos continued. Sporadically during her, her speech, she was booed. And the boos had been described as, and I quote, resounding. Uh, she handled it well afterwards. She said, this is America, and people have a right to express themselves. Uh, I have to say this. Uh, we, we have a saying in this country. You don't punish the child for the sins of the father. You don't punish the child for the sins of the father. You should not punish the wife for the sins of the husband. You should not punish the wife for the sins of the husband. And that's why I feel bad for her. Uh, she married him. She stuck with him. But she should not be abused. Very simple. She should not be abused. Where am I now? Where am I? How's my time frame here doing? Okay. Broadway shows. This past week, in the year 1977, the musical Camelot opened. Camelot. Uh, starred great musical. Julie Adams played Guinevere. Richard Burton, King Arthur. And Robert Goulet, Lancelot. I grew up in Utica, New York. Not a big town, not a small town, 100, 125,000 people. But we never saw musicals unless they were put on at the high school. In fact, I don't remember a, a musical at the high school. We did plays, uh, dramas. Uh, so I never made it to Broadway to see these shows. Even though I went to college in New York City, Manhattan College, I could not afford to go to Broadway to see a show. It was that simple. Anyhow. During my first year out of college, I saw three musicals back to back, and they sort of changed my life and changed what I enjoyed because I really wasn't into music. I saw in succession over a one-year period on Broadway, Camelot, Sound of Music, and My Fair Lady. Camelot, Sound of Music, and My Fair Lady could not have done better I don't think I saw a drama on Broadway for the first 20 years. I used to go to Broadway all the time. Uh, I'd rather go pay for the ticket to see the Broadway show than go out and have a big dinner and a lot of drinks. Uh, and then finally, after 20, 25 years, I finally saw a drama. It was nice. It was interesting. But I went back to seeing musicals. Okay, now. French fries. We're going to have a shortage of French fries this coming year. I'm laughing. But we are going to have a shortage of French fries. Uh, and that's because we've had a weak potato harvest this past year. 
the wheat potato harvest caused by cold temperatures and the impact, listen to this, of Hurricane Dorian in the United States and Canada. Canada took a beating from Dorian also. Now, it is projected by the experts that the United States potato output output will drop by 6.1% in the coming year. Hmm. And that the Canadian, they're really going to get hit, their potato output will drop by 18%. The 6.1% drop of the United States output is the lowest since 2000. The Idaho potato, we all hear about the Idaho potato, America's greatest potato. Uh, they, uh, Idaho's the top producer of potatoes in the United States. Their harvest will fall 5.5%. And this means, from what the economists tell us, we're either going to get fewer French fries or pay more for them in the coming year. Now, the quality of our jobs in the United States, which have been created in the last 30 years, from 1990, have been low-wage jobs. Uh, Two-thirds of those jobs are low-paying jobs. We know that more and more jobs are created every year. Trump keeps telling us all the new jobs he has, and it's true. But they're all crappy paying jobs, okay? You can't live on a McDonald's salary or making uh, chicken sandwiches at Popeye's, and this is what's happening. And because two-thirds of the new jobs over the last 30 years have been low-paying jobs, it's one of the biggest factors in the systematic erosion of the middle class in America. Half of United States workers make less than $33,000 a year, while the cost of living has steadily increased. Homing costs, health costs, other basic uh, uh, necessities, they have been rising faster than paychecks. And so that's the story. So when you hear Donald say, oh, more jobs than ever before, where are those people working? And they're getting seven fifty an hour, ten dollars an hour. You can't support a family on that. Can't even support one person on that. We've got to do something about this. <coughs> Excuse me. Which also brings me to manufacturing in this country. I've talked about it several times in the past few months. It continues to contract. In other words, our manufacturing level is slipping. There's less and less manufacturing in this country. This is the fourth consecutive month. I'm talking about the month of October was the fourth, November rather, the fourth consecutive month uh, that the number of manufacturing, uh, manufacturing numbers have dropped, which, in, which is an indication, no question, the business is getting worse. That's the story for this week. Uh, hope you enjoyed. I enjoy. I love doing this show. Uh, <clears throat> I, I, I suggest to you, I do a blog every morning. I tell you this every week recently. Uh, it takes you all of two or three minutes to bring it up on, the, on your computer and read it. I have 70,000 subscribers who read my blog. I'm, I'm proud of my blog, you have to understand. I love, I've been doing this for 13 years, never tried to solicit people for it. It just grew. And uh, it's keywestlu.com. That's all you got to do is put in keywestlu.com, and it comes up any time of the day, 24 hours a day. If you enjoy the show, you'll enjoy the blog. If you don't enjoy the show, don't even listen. If you don't even read the blog. And that, my friends, is the show for tonight. It has ended. Uh, thank you for joining me. This is Louis Patron signing off.